Hello, my name is Juan Ocampo, PhD fellow at Lyon University. In this series of videos titled Financial Inclusion for Vulnerable Communities, we will take a look into the ruling paradigms of economic growth, explain the concept of financial inclusion, and explore some of the trends aiming for a more inclusive financial system. The idea that economic growth is essential for prosperity has been established as the ruling paradigm in the Sustainable Development Agenda. By signing the United Nations 2030 Agenda, nations are expected to develop policies that aim to increase productive capacity, productive employment, resilient infrastructure, and of course, financial inclusion. Even though there isn't enough discussion on the fact that unconstrained economic growth might be in potential conflict with sustainability, growth is the paradigm that sets the world economic agenda. Economic growth is achieved through productivity enhancement investments. In broad terms, this paradigm suggests that activities such as saving money, starting a business, purchasing livestock or agricultural inputs are important factors in economic growth and to access the necessary capital, financial systems come into play. There are different stories in regard to financial systems and economic development. However, nurturing the agenda 23rd narrative, there is the idea that financial systems work as efficient allocators of capital. In very simple terms, what this means is that the bank's intermediaries are the most efficient actors when allocating people's savings into productivity enhancement investments. Through the success of these projects, funded with credits, investments, and loans, banks generate profit, some that will be given back to the individual savers, therefore creating economic growth. Based on this line of thought, Mainstream research has argued for the role of financial systems in economic development. Then, it becomes relevant to have a look into how is that banks create and allocate money. Studying in detail the financial systems goes beyond the scope of this video. It is interesting though. However, what it's important to understand is the process of creating and allocating capital. Our monetary system is based on reserve banking, which means that by keeping a fraction of the money that consumers save in their bank accounts, commercial banks are allowed to create money. Yes, they create the money, supply the credits and loans that are being demanded by individuals, small medium enterprises, bigger companies, or other small banks. In the capital allocation process, the financial system is then responsible to evaluate the value, risk, and trustworthiness of the borrowers and assure the more efficient assignment of capital. It is thought through this process of money creation and allocation that banks have an effect in economic growth. So let's make a recap. In the mainstream paradigm, the community development is based on entrepreneurial ability of individuals and organizations to create growth. This growth is funded by capital, which the financial system is said to be the more efficient actor to gather and allocate resources. Therefore, it's through the management of the financial relationships between banks, lenders, and borrowers that the financial system supports economic growth. However, most banks are for profit and their economic return is based on how good they can answer three questions. How much can they trust you? How much risk do you represent? And how valuable are you? Relationships can be complicated, don't you think? You need to find some value on it, be able to trust your counterpart and be willing to assume any potential risk. Well, this is what banks do. They handle these social financial relationships by analyzing collateral, credit histories, and people's connections. Although questionable, this is how the mainstream financial system works. Based on people's behavior and consumption patterns, banks construct a financial identity that will be used to evaluate the possibility to access capital, which in theory is being invested in productivity enhancement projects. Once you have accessed the system and created an identity, users can store savings, make payments, apply for loans and credits, and even manage a portfolio of financial assets, like stocks, funds, or bonds. This is, sounds good, doesn't it? Well, this might be true for some of us, but in reality, the financial system is not covering all segments of the population, and this has several consequences. People's limited social and financial backgrounds hinders the efficiency of the financial system. 
due to the profit mindset of the current structure. A lack of knowledge increases the risk and potential costs, therefore impeding the allocation of capital to center groups of the population. Mainstream research argues that these failures in the financial system slow economic growth and maintains inequality. For better or worse, being part of the financial system is key in our current society. In high-income countries, being part of this structure is a given. Unfortunately, this is not true for almost 1.7 adults who remain unbanked. And this is a complex and challenging problem. Being unbanked means that, no, that you are not trustworthy. Therefore, this population is neglected by the financial system and therefore more vulnerable to economic shocks. The financial system discourse is embedded in the economic growth and sustainable development agenda that today dominates the world. And therefore, real financial inclusion must be a priority for the developing world. I would like to end this entry with some final considerations. After this broad exploration of the underlying mechanisms of financial systems and economic growth, it is worth questioning. Is this financial system suitable for people in conditions of vulnerability? Being economic growth the ruling paradigm, how can vulnerable populations be empowered in order to assure that an economic growth for all? Also, can this paradigm be under utilizing the social capital, capital embedded in communities? Personal information is key for the financial system to work, but the sources of this information are not always accessible for communities in vulnerability. However, and in acknowledging that embedded in many communities there are social and financial relationships, it is worth asking if there are ways to leverage on community practices to create trustworthy information and develop a more inclusive financial system. Thanks for watching, and if you have any comment or question, please get in touch.